All right. <laughs> so uh, let's start. Um, so to today's discussion uh, is about trying to limit the memory use of user space per CPU data structures uh, within containers. So let's see if it works. The arrow key is working. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Okay. So uh, there are a couple of use cases uh, to, uh, which require using a CPU number value to index stuff in user space. Uh, some of them, so ring buffers for tracing. I maintain the LTTNG user space tracer, so that's uh, one use case there. Uh, memory allocators such as TC malloc, GE malloc, if they have uh, per uh, CPU arenas. Uh, uh, the GNU library malloc also can, could use that information to kind of size its number of arenas it allocates from. Some caches, for instance, the NPTL uh, thread uh, stack caches in the GNU libc. Some user space schedulers, uh, statistics counters, and also just to scale automatically the number of threads within the process. So the problem context here, uh, so new machines, they more and more have tons of hardware threads. Uh, so the AMD APIC, for instance, has 412 or more hardware threads. So that brings interesting challenges in terms of memory consumption when you allocate per CPU data structures in user space. Uh, side note, the restartable sequence per memory map concurrency IDs that has been upstream in Linux 6.3 allows indexing user space with a kind of logical CPU number that is close to zero based on the number of concurrently running threads within the, uh, the process. So I plan to apply that same concept to IPC namespace, so eventually I could do that over shared memory as well for tracing. That's another story, not for today, but it gives an idea of where I want to get at. So currently what people can use, they can use CPU sets. If they want to limit the, the amount of concurrency that uh, one of their uh, CPU set C group or container, more generally speaking, uh, uh, over, uh, over their machine. So that can uh, provide upper bounds. Uh, so you can say CP, CPU set zero to 31, for instance. Uh, uh, however, so, so basically if you have, uh, yeah, so, that's the, C, the CPU, so CPU set is one thing, CPU, uh, uh, the CPU C group allows uh, limiting the amount of time per time slice uh, that, a given, uh, that the given C group can take. This one is more general than CPU set. It's, it requires less information about the topology of the system, but it does not allow limiting the amount of concurrency that a given C group can have uh, on the overall machine. And the CPU sets are really not ideal to describe constraints in a cloud native way. So they are bound to the machine chip topology. They are hard to compose. Uh, it is hard to compose containers that are expressed with CPU set constraints. And it's it becomes even more tricky on big little or picori core CPUs, where you basically limit the freedom of the scheduler to make decisions about task placement. So the proposal I want to discuss, and this is, yeah, okay, is basically adding something that could look like a CPU max concurrency interface to the uh, CPU C group. So that interface file would allow the scheduler to track or to put an upper bound to the maximum number of CPUs that can be concurrently used by that C group. Uh, so see it as uh, those are the only run queues the number of run queues in which tasks from that C group can be enqueued. So uh, that sh would have to come with extension of the scheduler to constrain migration uh, to the currently used set of CPUs when that maximum bound is reached. And of course, there would be some trickiness when we want to migrate perhaps a whole group of, of uh, threads uh, to a different uh, CPU. Uh, while still preserving the, respecting those uh, upper bounds. So uh, some ideas I have on how to do it. So this could be achieved uh, by counting the number of threads in each run queue belonging to the C group uh, within per CPU counters. Then we track the total number of used CPUs in the global counter within the C group, and it only ever changes when those per CPU counters flip between zero and non-zero. 
uh, zero and one actually. Uh, and then we could even track the set of your CPU in a per C group CPU mask. So that could be useful after that. Uh, there would be some gotchas, uh, things like SCED set affinity or CPU set. If they are nested within this constraint C group and they try to apply, let's say, pinning of threads uh, over more cores than what is allowed by the max bound, I think they should fail but that's up to discussion. Likewise, if you try to constrain dynamically your concurrency limit uh, with, to a value that is not possible to, to allow given the current uh, uh, pinning of the threads within your C group, I would probably make that fail as well. So, uh, yeah. So moving threads around run queue, across run queues might be tricky. I'd have to look at the details. But the idea is you don't want to temporarily go beyond your limits as you move the threads around. So we'd have to figure out a way to do this. I don't have a good uh, handle on this yet. Um, and yeah, should we allow changing the max concurrency limits dynamically? I guess so. Kind of increasing dynamically the uh, allowed uh, concurrency for a container sounds useful, but you guys know better than I. Uh, I basically discussed this idea with Peter Zistra yesterday, and he was open to it. So he told me if the Kubernetes people say they need it, I'm open to that kind of scheme in the scheduler. So, uh, question, discussion, yep. Yeah, so I mean, I'm just going to repeat what we already said, like, uh, at least speaking for what we've done in, in, in Incas and, and next day before, like, it's effectively the mechanism we've been missing. Like we've got, you know, people are like, oh, I want four CPUs. And the way we do it right now is that we do like an in-user space scheduler, effectively, that does CPU set pinning, um, which is getting more and more problematic, as you mentioned, big little. Uh, also, I mean, we need to have now new awareness in user space, and we need to have like a whole bunch of the knowledge. I mean, yeah, like fancy epics with like weird multi-die things and all that kind of stuff. We need to know that now in user space, which is really not fun. So being able to just tell the scheduler, hey, actually, you just want to expose X number of CPUs and be done with it, uh, that's effectively what, what we'd want. I think that would be pretty good. Like, obviously, we do have users scaling up and down pretty often. Uh, I think it's perfectly fine for it to fail. So if you just try to, to yeah, scale down and you're actively using it, then that should, that should fail. Uh, if you try to scale up past what you're supposed to be able to do, that should also fail. Um, the reality is that even shrinking will work in 99% of cases because it's like process is act actively doing set affinity. Mm, there are some, but not super common. So it, it should still work in most cases. Uh, there you go. Yeah, I think the t this sounds great uh, overall. So very, very plus one. Uh, to your last bullet point, um, I wonder. I think it feels to me, I don't know, like user space is always going to be too dumb to understand like what that it means. You know what I mean? Like I, I'm trying to imagine like, you know, the JVM or something like shrinking the number of threads because they were smart enough to query this. I guess they could do it, but. Do you mean on the query side or on changing the number dynamically? Yeah, I guess, so I assume the reason you put this bullet point here is because it takes some effort to make that happen. And you're wondering, like, is it worth it? And I'm saying, like, ah, maybe not, because, like, our, like the way basically everything works today is you start it up, it looks at get, get affinity or whatever, and then that's what it, ha that's what it spawns. So, so we have customers implementing also their own kind of orchestrator of, of uh, containers. And they have requirements uh, for kind of growing that dynamically for a couple of seconds or minutes and then grow, uh, moving back up in the telecom area. What, is it custom software? Is it some like, So they like, need to do their custom orchestrator because there's nothing that allow expressing that, right? Yeah. Uh, but I, I think if we do that properly in the Linux scheduler with the proper C, uh, C group. And, and so then, then, then you think the language runtimes and memory allocators and all those people would would implement it? Well, I guess. I mean, it, so, so the other thing is, I'm providing the concurrency ID. So basically, it, if we have that, I can bound the ma memory consumption of concurrency IDs. Mm -hmm. So people just have to use that. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's it. Yeah. Um, I was going to say, that, I mean, my feeling is that, I mean, given the fact that you can, I mean, 
yes, in general, most people set a particular limit and then they just run it, but like uh, all container runtimes let you change those limits dynamically and like that's something which like, yeah, in production you probably don't do, but like it is a thing that people practically would want to do and like the more like E and vowels you get from random places, the more annoying it gets for everything. So like if, it, yeah, I don't know. Actually, um, one thing we could do is replicate the concept of maximum possible number of CPUs and online number of CPUs. So what we could maybe add is one value that is never changing after creation of the C group. That one is the max possible number of CPUs from the point of view of within the container. And then you could have one other value that can be changed dynamically. That's the online CPUs, and that could change. We have that now, and people screw up looking at it. So, like, I have little could confidence. Could be a single thing as well. Yeah, I think a single thing is better. Keep it simple, stupid. <laughs> so the failure mode for having more threads than CPUs is actually very, very soft. So I think it's fine if you end up not noticing that your CPU count went down by half and you have too many threads and just you're, you get a bit of a slowdown and otherwise everything is okay. And I think effectively, like if you get a refusal from the kernel to lower the number, you can only ignore it. So actually doing something that works mostly is, seems like a nicer solution overall. Yeah, I like they called out the uh, sketch and affinity thing at the beginning as the big issue. I think it would be really difficult to... What, what is a big issue? Sorry? Having the user configure sketch set affinity or CPU sets within the container. Having it fail, you mean? No, just any kind of user constraints that they add makes yes, your job yes, a yes. lot more difficult. That's the, that's the problem I'm trying to solve there. Yeah, but I think in your point you call out that you want to make sure that it's feasible to construct a mask if the user specifies, you know, different yes, CPU because sets. because users are, are still going to have some use cases where they want to pin uh, some threads on specific cores so they don't move around. Or, I mean, th there are some customization that people will want to do to the mask, so. Right, but like even a very simple example, you could have one thread defined to like CPUs one and two, and another thread defined to CPUs two and three. So technically there's an overlap and you set the max concurrency to one, the scheduler could say I'll run both threads on CPU two, but it has to go and figure that out. I think it'd be really complicated to actually work that out. Actually, I got an idea. Uh, so I could reuse the concurrency IDs and virtualize the CPU sets that are used for set affinity and CPU sets which are under those constraints. So make that kind of virtual. I don't know if that would work, but maybe. So basically you'd say, I want to be on CPU 0, 1, 2, 3 with a CPU mask and everything, but that would be kind of within the set of CPU on which the scheduler is allowed to schedule you. I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know if we want to go there. Uh, I'm DNS software developer, so user space stuff but we care about the overhead of pushing very little packets. So for our use cases, we typically bind network queue to specific CPU and specific thread to that CPU. So everything is handled on a single CPU. So whatever you do, please make sure that, you know, <laughs> systems can be configured to be efficient. Yeah. Because if we push, you know, 50 byte packet across four different CPUs just because there is some magic virtualization and we don't understand the topology, the performance will go down the toilet. Yeah, so you won't control on the topology if you use CPU sets underneath those. I'm not saying that it has to be CPU set, but in some way it or, can or be set affinity. some yeah. different interface you dream tomorrow. Yeah. I, I don't care yeah. how the interface looks like, but we need an ability to somehow take into account the hardware topology and pin the yeah. things to the right places. And, and my initial intent is really not to take that away from the end user. It would be that constraint would be applied and then the users, as they pin threads and it fits within the, the, the existing constraint, they, they get what they want and then the scheduler takes into account those restrictions 
and move things around so it still respects the, the overall constraint. That, that's my initial idea. Okay, sounds good, thank you. But does, does that mean you would expose a modified topology? Because uh, the topology can be read through SysFS and reconstructed, but now if the CPU numbers do not correspond to the physical CPU numbers, it would have to change everything. No, no, I would not change that. Uh, so, so, but that's, uh, that opens the question on how you want to expose that max uh, limit. I, I'm open to ideas there. Sure. Right. Uh, one idea would be is like, you know that with the CPU set, you can do domain, right? You can say root domain, you can constrain, you know, you can put certain CPUs and say this is the root domain and no other CPUs can use it. In the different types of domain, possibly you want to create a new domain which says that, you know, that will take care of topo topology thing and remaining of CPU set would just work like normally. You can just put a couple of CPUs, uh, establish a new thing which says that, you know, uh, this is uh, affinity kind of domain on any name you want and all the other CPUs under it would work specifically based on topology. So uh, any C groups under that would be like, if you do something wrong with the topology, then you, you give an e, you know, uh, invalid kind of a message. Possibly you wanna check that. So if someone specifies a topology that cannot be respected under those huh, constraints? So, uh, in, in case, if you, if you don't want to, uh, if you wanted to coexist, go exist as such, uh, so CPU set as if now uh, it gives you like, you can convert one particular C group as root domain, which me, and you can create you know, subdomains below it, yes. as of now. And uh, we have member and root. Possibly you want to add one more thing that says that, you know, which anything below this is going to respect the whole topological things, if, if that might work. Okay. Okay. I, I'm not sure I, I fully understand your idea, so we might want to discuss that more after. Yeah, thanks. We're a bit over time. Was there any other, other question to, to cover? Was there one there? Okay. And then we can wrap it up and can always ask in the whole word back. Yeah, quick suggestion. Um, one thing that's nice about this is it gives better performance consistency because even if the machine is idle, it's going to constrain how many cores that the job can use. But you're defining this in terms of logical CPUs. It might be useful to add a limit to, for example, the number of physical cores that a C group can use because whether it's using, you know, adjacent hyper twins of a single core versus spraying out to lots of individual cores matters a lot in terms of the performance it's actually gonna get. And you could also do the same for like uh, max concurrent CCX or like any kind of topology domain. Yeah, so I, I see how, how the scheduler um, do task placement, I, I see that as a separate problem than the one I'm trying to fix here. I'm just trying to limit the number of CPUs, not limit how task placement is done in terms of uh, migrations and load balancing. Uh, I had interesting discussions uh, earlier today uh, with uh, Peter Zistra where, I mean, some ideas, I mean, what, you're so what it sounds like you're describing there is you're interested in making the scheduler aware of the cost of cash misses caused by task placement. You, so you want to place tasks in a way that minimize the amount of cache misses so you optimize for. So sometimes it's just to pack all the tasks uh, within all the cores that share a single L3, for instance, but if the workload does not fit in the L3, then you might want to spill over into a different one. So, I mean, one thing to look into, and that's what I suggested earlier today to Peter, um, would be to use performance monitoring unit counters to kind of instrument how each task behave and try to figure out uh, are they well pla placed, should they be moved, what's their cost in terms of memory, is it a uh, memory I.O. bound task or is it a CPU intensive task without using much memory. So you could then de make decisions about how you pack things together. So, so, but I think this goes beyond the scope of just limiting, limiting the number of CPU. My, my goal here is to limit memory use. So my users, the problems they have is they have those huge machine where they have sm many, many small containers and I, I allocate per CPU data there. I mean, they, they're wasting tons of memory. Just doesn't work for them. So that's my initial problem is that mem memory allocation. The problem you describe is interesting, but I think it's more about task placement to uh, minimize uh, uh, cache misses and communication or latency or delays. All right, thank you all for, for attending another uh, Cadenas and Micro Conference um, at Plumbers and hope to see you all next year. Thank you. <laughs>